In Islam, the most essential belief is called Tawheed, which refers to the strictest form of Unitarian monotheism imaginable. This is the absolute oneness of God in Islam. In Islam, God is utterly alone, and because adherence to Tawheed is the highest and most important commandment in the religion, then the greatest sin is called Shirk, which is opposite of Tawheed. Shirk in Islam is idolatry or associating partners with God. As one Muslim group in Toronto has stated in their publication Invitation to Islam, murder, rape, child molestation, genocide. These are all some of the appalling crimes which occur in our world today. Many would think that these are the worst possible offenses which could be committed, but there is something which outweighs all these crimes put together. It is the crime of shirk. As the Quran said, surely they have disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary. But the Messiah said, O children of Israel, worship Allah exclusively. Quran 572. This verse is evidence that those who associate with Allah are kuffar and commit shirk, or the greatest shirk. If a person dies committing shirk and never repents of it, he will be permanent resident in hellfire. While the unpardonable sin in the Bible is to deny or blaspheme the Holy Spirit as God, in Islam believing that God is the Holy Spirit is an unpardonable sin. Of course, that's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. The Holy Spirit, according to Islam, is the angel who spoke to Muhammad. Yet the being that spoke to Muhammad bears far more resemblance to Lucifer that's in the Bible than to any heavenly angel. Imagine that believing in the divinity of Christ is considered by many Muslims to be a far worse sin than committing murder. Meanwhile, in the backwards world of Islam, the Muslims of Sudan are even now carrying out a literal genocide against the black Sudanese, while the rest of the Muslim world turns its collective head and looks the other way. But believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you stir up a hornet's nest. Neither the demons nor the Muslims can tolerate the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Lord of all. This denial is found several times that Islam denying the sun. This is throughout the Quran. In the Quran it says, In blasphemy indeed are those that say that God is Christ, the son of Mary. They said that most gracious had begotten a son. You have uttered a gross blasphemy. The heavens are about to shatter, the earth is about to tear asunder, and the mountains are about to crumble, because they claim that the Most Gracious has begotten a son. It is not befitting the Most Gracious that he should beget a son. Quran 1988-92 Another verse in the Quran states, The Christians call Christ the Son of Allah. There is a saying from their mouth in this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Quran 930. The Quran literally pronounces a curse on those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. People who say such things utter gross blasphemies and are likened to unbelievers or kuffar infidels. In his Institutes of Religion, Protestant reformer John Calvin rightly stated that the Muslims, although they proclaim at the top of their lungs that the creator of heaven and earth is God, still, while repudiating Christ, they substitute an idol in the place of the true God. While Islam attempts to create an acceptable form of monotheistic worship, it not only leaves out the most essential aspects of the saving relationship with God, 
but it also confronts these things head on and calls them the highest forms of blasphemy. A quote from the Quran, far be it from God that he should have a son. These words encircle the inside of the dome of the rock. This is the very location where for centuries God's people, the Jews, worshipped in their temple awaiting their Messiah. This is also where Jesus, the Son of God, the Jewish Messiah, will someday rule over the earth. Islam has literally built a monument of unreserved defiance to this future reality. But what is the grievous penalty that shall befall those who believe such things? According to Islamic narrative, Jesus will return to kill these polytheists or the Trinitarian Christians. But it does not end here. The Quran does not stop at denying that Jesus is the Son of God or that God exists as a Trinity. With tears in his eyes, the Apostle Paul warned the Thessalonians that, quote, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, Philippians 3.18. The church father Polycarp of the Smyrna is a disciple of the Apostle John, also linked a denial of the cross to the Antichrist spirit in no uncertain terms when he said that everyone who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is an Antichrist and whomever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil. Such a one is the firstborn of Satan. It should not come as a surprise then that Islam also denies the most central event of all redemptive history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That they say, the Quran says, in boast we killed Christ, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, and those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow for a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power and wise. Quran 4, 157 to 8. Ironically, among Islamic scholars, there are actually numerous conflicting theories regarding exactly what happened to Jesus. As such, it is actually the Muslims who have only conjecture to follow. But despite their inability to arrive at any form of consensus regarding to what happened to Jesus, Muslims are very much in agreement on at least one issue. He never died on the cross. When anyone picks up a Bible, they are almost immediately confronted with the fact that Satan is the greatest deceiver in history. It was shortly after having eaten the forbidden fruit that Eve said, the serpent Satan deceived me, and I ate. In the New Testament, John the Apostle reminds us that Anyone who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Paul the Apostle elaborates on the deceptive role of the Antichrist when he also warned that the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. And as the Bible concludes, it encourages us all with the fact that in the end, the devil who deceived them will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Amazingly, all such unsavory descriptions of Satan are easily found scattered throughout the Quran. But I will start with the most damning reference. Allah's bargaining by calling himself Khayrul Makrim, which literally means the greatest of all deceivers. This is found in Quran 354. But what are the circumstances in the Quran in Surah 354 that are causing Allah to be deceptive? Interestingly, the deception is regarding the story of Jesus' crucifixion. In Surah 355 it states, When Allah said to Jesus, I shall cause you to die, 
then will raise you up to myself. Allah, in this story, supposedly deceived the people by not allowing Jesus to die on the cross and resurrecting him instead. As Christ was going about to do his father's work, Satan was concocting schemes for his firstborn, Muhammad. All of the most revered interpreters of the Quran, Ibn Kathir, Al-Tabari, Al-Jalalain, Al-Qurtubi, interpreted Quran 354 as referring to Allah deceiving people to believe that Jesus was crucified when he was not. Qurtubi observes that some scholars have considered the word the best of schemers to be the one of God's beautiful names. Thus, one would pray, O oh, best of schemers, scheme for me. This is a common Islamic prayer. Qurtubi also reports that the Prophet used to pray, O oh God, scheme for me and do not scheme against me. How is it that in the Bible it is the devil and his vessel, the Antichrist, that are repeatedly referred to as schemers, liars, deceivers? But in the Quran, it is Allah who is the greatest of all deceivers, and that's supposedly good. Satan knows full well who he is, and as he was inspiring the Quran, he couldn't help but brag a little bit. The Arabic words makara means to deceive, scheme, hatch up, cook up, connive. The Arabic Bible in Genesis 3.1 uses the same word for Satan. In Ahl al-Qur'an, which is the International Qur'anic Center, Mr. Sharif Sadiq explains the meaning of makara, to deceive, as attributed in the Qur'an, conniving, is a weapon, like any other weapon, could be used for good or for evil, like a knife or a gun. According to Sharif, there are two types of conniving, one which is forbidden and the other noble. Not only do Satan and Allah share the characteristic of being deceivers par excellence, they also both love to specifically target one group above any. In the Quran, Ahlul Kitab, or the people of the book, which is the followers of the Bible in this case, as the Quran calls them, the Bible warns that Jews and Christians are Satan's favorite target. Yet in the Quran, and all throughout this sacred text, they are targeted by Allah. Does not Jesus warn? For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you so ahead of time. So if anyone tells you that he is out in the desert, do not go out or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. As a Muslim, I understood that according to Islamic tradition, the Mahdi will find some supposedly lost portions of the Old and New Testaments and even the Ark of the Covenant. And through these finds, he will argue with the Jews and Christians and win some to Islam. Ka'b al-Ahbar, an early Muslim commentator says, quote, he will be called Mahdi because he will guide to something hidden and will bring out the Torah and the Gospel from a town called Antioch. A Suyuti, another Muslim scholar, said that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, He is called the Mahdi because he will guide the people to a mountain in Syria from which he will bring out the volumes of Torah to refute the Jews. At the hands of the Mahdi, the Ark of the Covenant will be brought forth from the lake of Tiberias and taken and placed in Jerusalem. I had always asked myself why Muslims were so specifically focused on attacking the integrity of the Bible. And today, not only Muslims, but the whole world. Even at most of the bookstores I visit, so many of the popular books are those that attack the historical Jesus and the reliability of the Bible. Rarely does one find a book that attacks the historical Buddha or the Bhagavad Gita, the Book of Mormon, the Yazidi al-Jilwah, Black Book, or the Quran, 
Nobody attacks these. I always wondered why. Why should they? For these lack any history or substance that is worthy of attack. Only a few Christians who will probably be called bigots expose these books and show the lack of real evidence that they truly don't have. So who is standing alone? Who truly believes in the one God? And who is uniting behind so many other gods? The Quran also lacks any detail to derive much of the history it supposedly documents. Instead, it only borrows apocryphal verses and old folk tales. I also asked myself this question. If the Jews were not truly God's people, then why did so many satanic empires and groups throughout history repeatedly make attempts to destroy them. Muslims all over the world spend so much time repeating and hammering on the claim that Israel does not belong in the land, that the Bible's history is fabricated, or simply that the Jews are evil. Why is there so much focus on attacking the destroying the Jews? And why are Muslims and Satan on the same side in this regard? Why is it that one of Mahdi's goals is to win converts from among the Christians and Jews, primarily by casting doubts on the reliability of the Bible? Why doesn't the Mahdi focus on the Hindus or the Buddhists? I have but one challenge to false gods of all non-biblical faiths. Declare to us the things to come. That's in Isaiah 41:22. Read it. If I may give the full challenge. The Bible says, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons. This is what the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things. Show us the history, what they were, that we may consider them and know the later end of them. Or declare to us things to come. Aha! Uh -huh. Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing and your works are nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. If a religion cannot predict the future, Isaiah chapter 41 says they are an abomination. Then the Lord continues, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declared before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Nowhere in any other text I've seen such a declaration except in the Bible. The Quran has none of these things. Archaeologists in the Middle East contribute to the publication called Biblical Archaeological Review that comes out monthly through its challenges of the Bible. You also find much evidence attesting to historic confirmation of scripture. I ask, if the Quran was such a great works, have you ever heard of a Quranic archaeological review? It is only the biblical archaeological review. Why would the Muslim authorities put such a tight lid on the volumes of the oldest Qurans found in Al-Masjid Al-Kabir in Yemen? If I wish to purchase a facsimile copy of the Codex Vaticanus, I may do so. Why are copies of the top copy Quranic manuscript, considered one of the oldest Quranic manuscripts, still sitting unexamined in the top copy museum in Turkey? What are they afraid of? Why can't the oldest Quranic manuscripts face the same kind of critical examination that the most ancient biblical manuscripts had to endure for centuries? I will tell you the reason. Because numerous Aberrations from the standard Quranic text are found in all of those older manuscripts. Such aberrations, though not surprisingly to textual historians, are troubling at odds with the orthodox Muslim claims that the Quran has reached us today exactly as it came down. It has not a jot or a dot missing. That's the claim. Why would the Yemen, then, and the Turkish authorities close the door on the research? The Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, were found to validate the authenticity of the Bible. In the Quran, Islam challenges mankind, quote, 
bring your proof if you are truthful. Islam challenges the world to bring something like the Quran because the Quran is such a miraculous book as they claim. What about the future of mankind? Is that all we should be focused on? Can the Quran provide 1,362 verses of a prophetic nature? Yet a prophecy from the Bible is fulfilled and the world goes mad over it. How can anyone explain Israel's return? Quote, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Isaiah 43, 5-6. It is this God that I serve, the one who, quote, says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, Isaiah 44, 26. God promised to restore Jerusalem and Israel, and he is doing it. Imam al-Ghazali, one of the most famous Muslim theologians of all time, encourages lying so long as any positive or beneficial goal may be achieved. I quote, Speaking is a means to achieve objectives. If a praiseworthy aim is attainable through both telling the truth and lying, it is unlawful to accomplish it through lying because there is no need for it. When it is possible to achieve such an aim by lying, but not by telling the truth, it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible. Talk about situational ethics. Imagine one of the Ten Commandments stating, Thou shalt not lie, and thou shalt not tell the truth. But one should do whatever is best to achieve victory. Ghazali also instructs Muslims to lie in order to attain material prosperity. I quote, Know this, that lying is not sin by itself. But if it brings harm to you, it could be ugly. However, you can lie if that will keep you from evil or if it will result in prosperity. Abdullah al-Arabi rightly comments regarding the danger of that practice of lying in Islam is for the West. The principle of sanctioning lying for the cause of for Islam bears grave implications in matters relating to the spread of the religion of Islam in the West. Muslim activists employ deceptive tactics in their attempts to polish Islam's image and make it more attractive to prospective converts. Even many so-called moderate Muslims, in order to protect the image of Islam, the religion of peace after 9-11, they began to lead a double life. One side expressed aggression to the West in private meetings and the other side expressed tolerance and peace in front of Western audiences. Take, for example, Siraj Wahaj, the first Muslim to deliver the daily prayer and speeches for love, brotherhood, and harmony before the U.S. House of Representatives. In speaking to a Muslim audience in New Jersey, he said that Muslims should, quote, take over the United States and replace its constitutional government with a caliphate. If we united and strong, we elect our own emir, which is a leader, and give allegiance to him. Take my word. If six to eight million Muslims unite in America, the country will come to us. This split personality is the cause of confusion because Americans in general, and unfortunately even many government leaders, I'm not digging into what these leaders say in Arabic, desperately wanting to believe the best of people in order to comfort themselves in times of great uncertainty. Most Westerners swallow much of the Islamic deception, hook, line, and sinker. Those few who are bold enough to speak the truth regarding the true nature of Islam are viewed and labeled as intolerant, hateful, bigoted, Islamophobic. One would think that Americans would be wise enough to wake up to this tired pattern by now. But apparently, ignorance truly is bliss. That is, until the front of the ship actually smashes, sort of like the Titanic, headlong into the iceberg.